Welcome back to our second meeting of biostatistics. Due to recent developments, we are shifting the course to be uh, online for the remainder of the course. And this is going to pose a few challenges to what we can or can't do um, as online differs a bit from being in person and face to face. But we're going to make the best of this and let's get started. So what we're going to work through in this second uh, set of meetings is first we're going to recap a little bit of the material that we talked about in the first meeting. So specifically, um, some reminders about multiple linear regression, what is confounding and effect modification, how do they work, um, what are their interpretations, and so on. Um, we're also going to talk a bit about the two-sample t-test and how we saw linear regression can be used as a way to do this sort of adjusted t-test. We're going to remind ourselves of the difference between predictive models and effect size models. And then some of the new stuff that we're going to cover in this meeting is we're going to talk a little bit about model building strategies and principles. So what's important when we, um, what's important to think about when we build a model to try and predict an outcome or when we build a model to try and estimate the effect of some variable on an outcome. We're also going to recap uh, a little bit about two by two tables. And by recap, I mean, this is material you've learned previously in prerequisite courses. So we're going to remind ourselves of the idea of the chi-squared test of independence, attributable risk, risk ratios, and odds ratios. Then we're going to move into talking a bit about logistic regression, and we're going to see how logistic regression can allow us to estimate odds ratios. And we can use logistic regression to estimate an odds ratio adjusted for other variables. So taking confounders into account. We're also going to learn a little bit about what does effect modification look like in logistic regression and how can we deal with that. And then towards the very end, we'll talk very briefly just about what Poisson regression is and what it can be used for, as well as survival analysis. And really these are just mentioning them in concept so that we're aware of them and you can build that knowledge after this course if you need to. So a quick reminder that the type of variables we have are important as they help us decide which summaries are appropriate, which graphical displays um, are appropriate, methods of analysis available to us, so we've learned that variables are either categorical or numeric. Right? So they're either placing people into categories, such as biological sex, male or female, country of birth, things like these, exposed or not exposed, diseased or not diseased, as well as variables can be numeric. These are things like height, weight, age, numerical or quantitative measurements. The variable that we denote with Y is our outcome variable. And this is the, sometimes gets called the dependent variable or response variable. We're going to use X to indicate the explanatory variable. And again, uh, this also goes by names of independent variable or predictor variables or covariates. So here we want to know how does X affect Y? Okay, when X changes, what happens to Y? So that's the direction of association we're interested in. We learned a little bit about bivariate or two variable analysis. What we're going to talk about in this meeting is the number one and number two there. So if our x variable is categorical and our y is also categorical, how does a categorical x variable affect a categorical y variable? We can look at things like the chi-squared test, attributable risk, risk ratio, or odds ratios. And we'll recap what those are. Number two, we might be looking at a situation where x is a numeric variable and y is categorical. So something like what effect does age have on risk of high blood pressure, yes or no? And here we can use logistic regression. And we'll see that actually number one and number two are very much related, similar to what we saw for points three and four there. In our previous meeting, we talked about looking at relationship between an X variable that's categorical and a Y that's numeric. So say comparing systolic blood pressure for males and females. And we saw we can do the t-test or analysis of variance and things like these. We explored some of those topics in our previous meeting. Um, number four, we might be looking at situations where X is numeric and our Y is also numeric. So maybe is there a relationship between BMI and systolic blood pressure? Okay, and for things like these, we can use correlation to describe the strength of association, or we can use things like simple linear regression to try and model Y as a function of X. And in our previous meeting, we saw how number three and number four are very much related. We actually spent some time, and you spent some time on the assignment as well, connecting the t-test and simple linear regression. So let's just quickly remind ourselves of some of the stuff we learned about the two-sample t-test in our first meeting. There we looked at a data set where we'd like to test, is the mean FEV, or the mean lung capacity, different for smokers and non-smokers? And we had this cross-sectional study 
of about 650 youth who were aged somewhere between 3 and 19 years old um, in East Boston, and this data was from the 1970s, and smoking was recorded as yes or no, and it was self-reported. So our X variable here is does someone smoke, yes or no. Our Y variable is numeric. It's a measure of uh, lung capacity or forced expiratory volume. So here the null hypothesis is that the mean lung capacity or mean FEV of smokers and non-smokers is the same versus an alternative hypothesis that they're not the same. If we went through and worked with this data, we'd find the mean lung capacity for smokers was 3.28 liters, the mean for non-smokers was 2.57 liters, or the difference in means was 0.71 liters. The mean lung capacity of smokers is 0.71 liters larger than non-smoker. We can also build a confidence interval for this, and we see that going from 0.49 up to 0.93, so we're 95% confident that the mean lung capacity for smokers is somewhere between 0.49 to 0.93 liters higher than non-smokers. If we carried out the two-sample t-test, we'd find that this has a really small p-value, less than 0.001, and we'd end up concluding that these two means are significantly different, or that the mean lung capacity for smokers is significantly larger than non-smokers. And we talked about um, how this is a clearly a biased conclusion. The mean lung capacity for smokers should not be larger than non-smokers. And we learned about the idea of confounding. Right? So there we talked about age as an important confounder. Age is going to be associated with the FEV or lung capacity. Right? As kids get older, their lungs get bigger. And age is also associated with smoking. As kids get older, they're more likely to smoke. So this met the criteria of a confounder, which we discussed in the previous meeting, and we'll recap it again soon, um, coming up in, in this lecture. We saw that we can use multiple linear regression as a way of doing sort of an adjusted t-test. So we could fit a linear regression model that includes both smoking and age to try and estimate the FEV or the lung capacity. And there, when we did that, we found that the coefficient for smoking came out to be negative 0.21, or in other words, the mean lung capacity for a smoker is 0.21 liters lower than a non-smoker, adjusting for age. Right again, taking two people who are the same age, we'd expect the smoker's lung capacity to be about 0.21 liters lower than the non-smoker. In today's discussion, we're going to see a very similar approach we can use when our outcome is categorical, um, yes or no. What we're going to do is first remind ourselves of things like chi-squared test, odds ratio, rate ratios, right? So this two by two table analysis. Then we'll acknowledge there may be confounding variables, and we'll look at how logistic regression can estimate an odds ratio adjusted for other confounders. So that's kind of the theme of today and where we're going with things. In order to get there, we're going to first just need to recap what is the chi-squared test, what is two by two table analysis, so odds ratios and rate ratios and those sorts of things. We'll also need to recap a bit of multiple linear regression that we covered last week and so on. So these are kind of the all the ideas we're going to build up to over this lecture. So let's take a little bit of time and just remind ourselves of the um, chi-square test of independence. So this is a topic you've learned previously. Um, we're going to remind ourselves or re refresh a little bit on it. And an important note, we're not going to plug into formulas. We're not going to calculate the chi-square test statistic by hand. What we'd like to do is remind ourselves, what is this test? What is it used for? How does it work? And so on. Ignoring the mechanics of how do we actually calculate the test statistic. So here we've got some example data. This is looking at group of children, if they were vaccinated for MMR, yes or no, and later in life if they were diagnosed with autism, yes or no. Okay, and we'd like to measure, is there an association between these two variables? The chi-square test can be used to test if there is an association between two categorical variables. So here, our null hypothesis will be that X and Y are independent or unassociated. Okay, there is no association between vaccination for MMR and autism. The alternative hypothesis is that they are dependent or associated, and that there is an association between getting vaccinated for MMR and autism. The way this test works is we have the observed data table. That's the table shown on the left. This is our data that we've got from our sample. Then what we can do is create an expected table. And here, the expected table is saying, if we had the same um, number of people in our study who are autistic and not, if we had the same number of people who are vaccinated and not, not vaccinated, okay, so the row totals and column totals in this table were fixed. They were the same as what was in our original sample. How many people would we expect to fall into each cell of the table? If the null hypothesis is true, 
or if there is no association between the two. So in other words, we saw that in our sample there were 621 individuals who were vaccinated and later diagnosed with autism. If there's no association at all between these two variables, we'd expect to see about 605.25 individuals who were vaccinated and diagnosed with autism. And now, the test statistic for the chi-square test compares the observed cell counts to the expected cell counts. So in other words, it's going to compare that 621 that we observed to the 605.25 that we'd expect to see there if the null is true and if these are unassociated. Okay, so for each cell in the table, we'd work out the expected cell counts and we'd compare the observed cell count to the expected cell count. If these are quite similar, as they are in this case, the 621 and the 605, the test statistic is going to stay um, pretty small. If um, vaccination and autism are associated, the observed and the expected table should look quite different. And if they look quite different, the test statistic is going to grow large. Okay, so this is how we can try and compare um, or test is there an association between two categorical variables. If we carried this out, we'd find the p-value to be 0 0.1309. We'd find that there is not a statistically significant association. Okay, so we do not have any evidence to believe vaccination for MMR and autism are associated. Now one important note is that the chi-square test gives us no indication of the direction or the strength of the association if one exists. Okay, so suppose that our test concluded there was an association. Okay, there's not. We know that there's not. But if the test said we have evidence to believe there is an association between vaccination and autism status, it would not tell us the direction, okay, meaning it wouldn't tell us if vaccination makes you more likely to develop autism or less likely. And the chi-square test also does not tell you the strength of that association. So let's suppose that vaccination made one more likely to develop autism. Does it make you 10% more likely to develop autism? Or does getting vaccinated make you twice as likely to develop autism? That's what I mean by this. The chi-square test just tells us there's no evidence of association or there's evidence that the two are associated. But it doesn't tell us what's the direction of that association or the strength of that association. One important note, the chi-square test of independence also assumes that the data came from a random sample that we have expected cell counts of at least five, okay, and we need to have at least one person in each cell of the table. An important note, since it's just simple two by two table analysis or two variable analysis, this does not allow us to um, address confounding in any way. Just something to think about, it was noted that um, if the chi-square test was significant, right, if there was evidence of an association, it would not tell us anything about the strength or direction of that association. What I want you to do is take a moment to think of, can you think of any estimates or any measures we can calculate that help us describe the direction or strength of association between two categorical variables? I'll give you a moment to think about that, and then I'm going to shout out some answers. Okay, so maybe you've taken time to think about it, maybe you haven't. Either way, estimates we can calculate to try and measure association between two categorical variables include things like the attributable risk, okay, or risk difference, things like the risk ratio or rate ratio, as well as the odds ratio. Okay, so these are all measures we're going to talk about later in this lecture. So we, I guess on this slide we've already noted that here, um, and I guess one other thing we'll add to that, we'll also see how we can take these measures and adjust for other confounding factors or include effect modification by using things like logistic regression or Poisson regression, topics that we're going to discuss throughout today's lecture. Stick around guys, there's more to see and please stay safe.